Well, HPLC, the UHPLC method, you can see the peak is down here, blown up. You get complete baseline resolution of these two molecules. So this is part of what's driving uh, that improvement in number of detected compounds, um, but also, again, the optimized injections uh, helps out a great deal as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other really major improvement that we were able to get out of um, switching to the UHPLC was a dramatic reduction in process variability. So we were actually able to, again, just by making this uh, upgrade to the LC system, decrease process variability by 50 percent. Um, and given that the end, uh, that the end point is to be able to detect biological response, if um, the smaller your process variability, the smaller the biological variability you'll be able to accurately define and, uh, and accurately measure. Uh, so it's very important to be able to drive your process variability as low as you can. Now it's also really uh, nice to point out that this is 9% um, on six technical replicates over the course of, uh, of two days. But this is 9% for 252 compounds in a complex matrix. This is in human plasma or an extract of human plasma. Um, so that is some phenomenal numbers for that many number of compounds. So what I've talked to you most uh, up to at this point is, is really the, the analytical side of of things, and in a, in a big way, this is actually the easiest part of what we have to do because once you can define your method, your method is set. Um, the real challenge comes in uh, processing of the data, and I really think this is an over-trivialized aspect of what we do. Um, you know, how are you going to process the data? What kind of statistical analysis are you going to do? How are you going to deal with false discovery? Um, how are you going to identify all of the small molecules that you've uh, detected? Um, you know, these are major challenges that, um, for a number of different reasons, haven't been addressed a great deal. Um, also, the amount of time that it takes to do this is, is pretty staggering. And for metabolomics to become a power, we're going to have to be able to address a way to do this work um, in a practical way, but also in a very cost-effective way. You know, we cannot spend months on a single project. It just simply will not work. Um, so Metabolon's approach here um, to try to streamline this process um, was first to build our own in-house library, and that was to help streamline that identification process, which can take a great deal of time. So our library currently contains uh, 1,500 compounds. Uh, and this is always growing. We're always adding new compounds to it as we discover new interesting classes or as we make identifications. Um, so it's constantly growing, and we add you know, any number of different um, types of molecules, you name it, it's probably in there. The library itself contains um, very specific information about uh, each of the authentic standards that are run. We record the retention time for that authentic standard. We record its MS mass profile specifically on the LC. So we record uh, any preferred adducts, any preferred in-source fragments, all of its isotopes. And then we also document all of the MS-MS fragmentation, uh, again, for the LC-EI spectra for the GC. Uh, but you'll notice here that we have, we document the MS-MS spectrum of the dimer. We record the MS-MS spectrum of the molecular and of the in-source fragment. So all of that information is documented about that molecule when we run it uh, to generate the library. Now there are obviously a lot of advantages to having this much of a comprehensive library in front of you. Um, one is the speed of the identification. Literally within um, minutes of the end of an analysis, all of the eye features that you detected have been searched against the library and the calls have been made. Um, now, not only are the calls made quickly, but because they're based on multiple criteria, the calls are also very high confidence calls. So for an um, experimental ion to be identified or to be called, it has to have the correct retention time, it has to have the correct parent mass on the LC, and it also has to have the correct fragmentation pattern. So this gives you a great deal of confidence that the call that you're actually making is accurate. Now, again, because we run the LC, because we run three separate platforms, you can imagine for a molecule 
that we detect on all three platforms, um, we actually have eight independent measurements of that particular molecule. So that just gives you that much confidence that when you're identifying an experimental ion, um, that you're making a good call. And that's very important. We don't want to waste our time. Um, we don't want to waste our time trying to, uh, I, or sorry, we don't want to waste our time having misidentified a compound and spend time down the line. Now, I just got a question. Um, how do you characterize unknowns? So we do have the ability to characterize unknowns. And in that case, we do a very traditional um, uh, accurate mass, uh, generate a molecular, molecular formula. So it's a very traditional approach when we need to do pure structure elucidation. Um, but again, because we have the library, we try to make all the identifications first based on those standards. And then if we find unknowns, then we go through the very traditional process. Um, and you are absolutely correct. Not every database is going to give the correct answer. Um, a lot of times, and we can discuss this a little bit further at the end, um, a lot of times what happens is you'll try to, you'll get a molecular formula and you plug it into your database and you have, you know, a thousand or a hundred potential molecular formulas. And that's really not enough information to make an identification, right? You need, you end up having to go for and collect MSMS to try to limit that. Um, it's a very arduous process, which is why we sort of implemented the library, because we needed to limit that time. Um, I think you'll find that the other sort of major disadvantage to trying to, um, to, trying to make the uh, uh, identifications uh, by that process is that um, I lost my train of thought. Sorry. I'll move on. I read the next question. This is my uh, breaking down of reading and talking at the same time. Uh, I have another question. Is deconvolution necessary for any type of GCMS data? Um, how about we get to that sort of question specifically closer to the end, if you don't mind? Um, so again, once the identification is made, we have, an, we have a high com highly confident um, identification. Now, sort of the top half of these advantages really have to do with the identification process and speeding that along. The bottom half is sort of uh, helpful in the sense of um, it's an advantage related to data processing, okay? What having a library does is it allows us to deconvolute the MS mass profile in the MS or in the LC. Now let me show you a specific example. So the rest of the traditional approach in this field is after you've collected all of your data uh, to take all of the ion features that you've detected and send them all immediately and unfiltered into statistics, okay? And then the idea is let stats figure out what's important and what's not important, okay? And an ion feature is just defined as a, a, a single chromatographic peak at a single mass, okay? So it's, it's one ion signature. Um, the problem with this approach is that these are redundant measurements of the same molecule. It's the molecular and in-source fragment and the dimer, all of phenylalanine. So these are redundant measurements of phenylalanine. Now, if you uh, take, for example, the, take for an example, why is this a problem? Um, the number of ion features that a given molecule is going to produce is going to vary on concentration, but also on individual chemical behavior. There are some small molecules that really prefer, that love to form dimers and trimers and tetramers. Uh, just a result of their own individual uh, behavior. So consider an example like this. We have phenylalanine. And in a given study, phenylalanine produces 12 individual ion features, whereas gamma glulu only has two, right? So you have the potential when you send these 14 individual ion features into stats, you actually have the potential of skewing your stats by overrepresenting phenylalanine, okay? Um, the second major sort of drawback to this approach is that all you're doing is, is increasing your false discovery rate because by putting 12 individual ion feature measurements in for only two molecules, that just means you're going to have that many more false, discovery, uh, false discoveries to have to you know, slog through on the back end, and that's just going to waste your time. So what the library allows us to do Sorry, hold on for a second. 